These are the images that come to mind when we think about the robe apocalypse. But what is the robe apocalypse? An apocalypse is an event involving catastrophic destruction. A robe apocalypse, presumably, would be such an event caused by robots. What kind of destruction are we talking about here? Physical destruction, environmental destruction, social and economic. There are a lot of other speakers this weekend that are talking about some of the other aspects of you know, AI and ethics, and so I'm really going to just focus on the last of the four today, economic destruction. Last year, on this very same stage, I spoke about the importance of making a distinction between responsibilities, jobs, employment, and finally, human livelihood and dignity. I spoke about how jobs consist of a set of responsibilities that may evolve over time. I talked about different classes of jobs, the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs that will be fully automated, the types of jobs where humans and robots will work together, where humans will delegate unwanted responsibilities to the robots, and finally, the new economy jobs, jobs that involve human ingenuity and creativity. I'm particularly interested in that second category, you know, the category where humans and robots work together, because at Cafe X, for example, that's exactly what we do. We hire a lot of people that we call coffee bar specialists, a lot of whom are former baristas. And the idea is that while the machine, the robot, does a sort of very monotonous, repetitive task of preparing beverages, that actually frees up the human being, our coffee bar specialist, to do higher level tasks. For example, explaining the difference between a cortado and a flat white or talking about the different types of roasts that we have on offer, almost acting as a coffee sommelier. Similarly, my wife's startup, Diligent Robotics, um, actually does something similar in the nursing space. So you know, nurses spend about a third of their time walking around hospitals, fetching and gathering, picking up supplies. And now with a robot, the robot can actually pick up dirty linens, drop off water bottles. And that's a really good thing. That frees up the nurse's time for valuable patient care. And so everything I spoke about last year around jobs and automation, that still holds true. What has changed in the last year is this. <laughs> With power comes responsibility. And our responsibility is to be informed. Our responsibility is to understand the historical and social context for the challenges that we face today. There has always been fear around automation. From the Industrial Revolution, to the advent of ATMs, to robotics today, those fears have always existed. And in the long run, those fears have proven to be unfounded. So with the Industrial Revolution today, we no longer have to weave fabrics by hand. That is a good thing. With ATMs, you know, a lot of people thought that all the banks were going to go out of business, and we know that not to be true. There is a bank on pretty much every single corner. It's just that the bank tellers, instead of dispensing and counting cash, their job is now to provide higher level services, maybe helping you figure out your retirement plans or how to save up uh, you know, for you know, future houses or other purchases that you want, might want to make. Um, and so you know, jobs have always been created as technology continues to progress. One of the things that should be concerning, however, is the increasing disparity in wealth. So for example, there was a recent uh, study by the London School of Economics that looked at the declining rent sharing behavior by the top 300 companies in the UK over the last couple of decades. A similar study by the Brookings Institute in the US um, looked at the declining share of income that was you know, um, given to labor over the last couple of decades. And in that same study, they also looked at different classes of workers. So the top quintile workers saw their wage growth, um, real wage growth increase by about 27% over the last couple of decades, while the bottom quintile of workers actually saw their real incomes decrease. And that should be concerning to us, because what that means is that the most economically vulnerable amongst us, the least privileged, they are going to be facing increasingly dire straits. But I think the question isn't so much, you know, is this due to automation or is this due to globalization, you know, which a lot of economists like to talk about? I think the real question we should be asking ourselves is, why are we allowing ourselves to be held hostage to the status quo? Why are we allowing the market to dictate people's livelihoods? Because if we had universal health care, basic income, 
a revamped education system, if we had all these things, we would be welcoming automation with open arms. We would be saying, yes, robot, please take away these dull, dirty, dangerous jobs. We would be welcoming the robots with open arms. And so the truth is this. There is no such thing as a robopocalypse. A robopocalypse is a lie. There has only ever been and only ever will be an apocalypse of our own making. An apocalypse caused by human hands, by the actions that we take or the actions that we fail to take, by the systems that we have set up to govern our society. And so what this means is that we need to take collective responsibility now. At the micro level, this means being responsible for our choices as consumers, employees, citizens. It means voting with our wallet. It means understanding the business models behind every transaction that we make, every service that we use. It means voting with our careers. It means getting involved with the industries that are the forefront of innovation to make sure that your voice is heard when important decisions are being made to make sure that you're in the room where it happens. And it means being thoughtful citizens, means voting, means being active participants in our democracy. Now, there's only so much that we as individuals can do, and so it's also really important that we have institutional change. We need to have a stronger social safety net, a new social contract, again, universal income, sorry, universal health care, basic income, revamped education to ensure that we can take care of the most vulnerable amongst us. But all of these policies, all, all, of this, all of these things that we want, they can only really come to pass if the government is truly representative. And so this is why it's so important, so, so, so important that we make sure that everyone has a fair and equal voice in our democracy. This is why the work that Stacey Abrams is doing with Fair Fight, the work that President Barack Obama is doing with the On the Line campaign to combat gerrymandering, it's really important that we have a level playing field for everyone. As Abrams sort of astutely pointed out yesterday, the policies that we care about live in the practice of voting. One last thing. The word apocalypse is actually derived from the ancient Greek, apocalypsis, meaning revelation or disclosure or an uncovering. And so if there is truly a robo-apocalypse or a robot revelation, that's actually not something we should be trying to prevent. We should actually be welcoming this because it means knowledge. All technology does, all automation does, all robotics does, is uncover the underlying fissures in our society, the things that have always happened, but now the sort of, the contrast is more clear, it's more evident, it's more obvious to us. It's forcing us to make those trade-offs now. And so with that in mind, my last thought is that, you know, if there is a robo-apocalypse, a robot revelation, I welcome it with open arms. I welcome the knowledge that it brings. I welcome the fight that we will now be forced to have with the sort of inherent biases, the underlying injustices in our system. And that fight starts with fair fight. That fight starts with all on the line. That fight starts with making sure that our government is truly by the people, for the people.